Earth Lovers, welcome back to another episode of Cineverse here on Hyper RPG episode Ooh. two. I'm very excited two. to be back. Guys, thank you so much to everybody who's been watching the very first premiere episode of Cineverse. Great conversation. We talked about all the Oscar nominations. Oh, nice. mm -hmm. um, we also talked about you know what our thoughts were on all that stuff, and we assigned some movies for you guys to watch. Uh, Call Me By Your Name, Shape of Water. Those are going to be mo most of the movies that we're going to be... That was like the homework we gave ourselves to watch to yeah. kind of give you our opinion on some of the movies that are nominated for Best Picture. And then collectively, we assigned homework of to watch... Uh, Catherine Bigelow's Detroit. Yeah, for those of you that didn't watch the first episode, we're kind of doing, because January tends to, tends to be a little bit of the slower time of year as yeah. far as movies go, uh, so we're using that to, uh, as required viewing to some extent, to bring back, we're talking about movies from 2017 that maybe we didn't get to talk about as the year went on, or maybe didn't get nominated, or anything like that. So yeah, that was Detroit was Elizabeth's pick. So looking forward to talking about that. And obviously, you can tell we are joined by a guest. Hey, hey how's it going, It's your everybody? boy. It's your boy. <laughs> One and only boy. How you doing, man? Pretty good. You know? We were talking earlier. You, uh, I think like most people, you know, very limited amount of times we all get to go to the movies. Oh, yeah. What was like a highlight movie that you got to see this oh, last year? Oh, goodness. This whole last year within the theater. Ooh, nominated, not nominated, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I uh, think I'm gonna have to give it if I'm going all of 2017. I'm gonna have to give it to Get Out because mm. it was a yeah. fun ride. I got to see it at the Arc Light. I saw it with my boys. We all made sure we went out to see it. Um, <laughs> technically, the quote unquote pool boys, me, Brody Reed, uh, Ben Bazune. We it was uh, so, and I believe it was in the Cinerama Dome if I oh, remember nice. correctly. Wild ride, love it. It was good. Um, and mostly because like a lot of the hit hit movies that. It, Specifically, the movies that we're going to talk about today, I didn't see in the theater. Mm. I uh, watched them on the small screen with those sweet, sweet screeners. Um, so did I. Yeah. Don't feel bad. Oh. Yeah, you're fine. It's fine. <laughs> hey, we got through it no matter what. Yeah. 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 You, you do what you got. You do what you got to do. Um, yeah. And so uh, sometimes we'll talk about movie news, but if there's any movie news to talk about. Uh, and I don't know. I mean, with this week, <laughs> there's kinda, been some weird stuff. There's been some weird stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ro or the Richard Roper thing was very interesting. Oh, so yeah, Rich let's talk about that. Uh, so Roper, this was on Tuesday night. Uh, Roper got suspended from the Chicago Sun Times. Oh yeah. Uh, for buying, so for possibly <laughs> buying Twitter follows or followers. Uh, and I thought this was so weird because I don't know how that's a suspendable offense. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, cause it's not like he got that job. He's not a YouTube star. It's not right. like that's how he got that job based out of his Twitter following. It's such a weird thing. And it's also so like, it's sort of a strange precedent that I don't want newspapers to do is well, to fire like people. Because you, <clears throat> you, did you see that huge article that came out about all the different people on Twitter who has fake followers who are buying followers? There's like yeah. a, actually mm -hmm. a pretty big, like well-researched article that came out. And I feel like. The, the 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 paper saw that and mm -hmm. it shook them like it like i feel like that paper's probably run by old people who don't get the internet and they're like oh <laughs> well this seems like it's wrong we got to we got to we got to suspend you i'm sorry yeah. or even more they're just doing it to show face like they don't they plan to bring him back but they're like we got to show that we We're care about the thing the yeah. kids are talking about Look, I'm not going to lie. Last year, I went to, I told Cameron about this. I went to Palm Springs. And while I was there for the week, and randomly, I started getting, you know, a bunch of followers, like thousands of followers. And I was like, this is really weird. I haven't yeah. really posted anything. And the only conclusion I came to was someone must have bought these for me. Uh -huh. And I know that's like a thing. Like, I've heard that's happened to other people. And it's such a weird concept to buy followers for yeah. people or to buy them yourselves. But even so, who fucking cares, I guess? Yeah. yeah. And that's the other thing. Is he a person who needs them? Yeah. Like, right. Do we need to check his? I mean, like he's in the same like like league with Ebert. You yeah. Don't, yeah. We don't need to check his stats before we check his review. Right. Yeah. It's like, do you have to hit a quota every month of that newspaper? Like, you gotta have, you have to sustain this many followers to like be able to review movies on our, you know, in our paper or yeah. on our site. Well, I feel like fake followers have been such a huge talking point just in the sense of like the way it's affected the election and mm. yada 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 yeah that there's this added weight to it to which it won't like for example people have been talking about how uh youtube has been deleting their tide pod any videos about right. tide pods even if it had nothing to do just because of the new meme sensation right. about eating them so i think it is that kind of scorch the earth any fraudulent 
Twitter activity is a suspendable uh, defense. But mm. you're right. It doesn't matter. Uh, also, like so many people do it, it's very easy to check who as uh, who who actually has bought followers. I could show you the site if you want to see if you bought them. Um, yeah, I actually <laughs> I actually ran my Twitter through that. Yeah, and it said I had like a couple thousand that were fake, and I'm like, oh, well, wow. I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're like, uh, yeah, this happened. I know it's it's very weird, and it's it's I don't know. You'd have to pay that service to block. You know the the yeah. big followers. There's also a lot of bots that just follow you based on keywords. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, totally. And I don't know if you've ever noticed if you've ever like put the name of a movie, like a current film, in Facebook. You'll all these bots oh, will post on comments mm. yeah. saying like this this movie is yeah. streaming in yeah, HD. You, oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. It's, yep. That's my new favorite weird thing that's been happening on the internet because friends will just be trying to have a regular discussion about <laughs> a movie and it's movie. just flooded with these weird bots yeah but anyway i'm just mentioning it because must see site works oh wow yeah i don't know how different the algorithm is but this is a guy who i would imagine tweets the names of popular movies frequently right. yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. Is that related? I who knows? So so weird. I uh, yeah, well, you know, we'll update if it turns out the Times fires him <laughs> down the line. So strange. Uh, yeah, so strange. Uh, so that was one weird story. Adam, you had the other weird story of the week what with the, the other one? Rotten Tomatoes. Oh yeah, this Facebook. Oh my god, this is so ridiculous. So this group on Facebook, create a Facebook group to basically infiltrate Rotten Tomatoes and downvote this movie to bring the audience score down to basically kill it. And from what it sounds like, it's mostly like DC fans. Yeah, for Black Panther, they're trying to do this for Black Panther. That their movies have been wrongfully critiqued by critics and by fan by certain fans who are Marvel fans. Are also the same. I think it's the same Facebook group who was trying to uh, basically do the same thing to Star Wars: The Last Jedi. Yeah. So they're just like on a full out war against anything that's Marvel or Star Wars. Thankfully, Rotten Tomatoes came out and actually released a statement, basically saying that like we don't support this sort of action on our website. You know, anyone who basically uses any sort of hate speech on our website to review this movie is going to be banned from our website. And I think Facebook actually removed the group. Yeah. Well, that's what's funny is, and that's why I was laughing at people whenever, because there's a lot of debate on movies and their Rotten Tomato score versus right. audience score. And I would mm-hmm. laugh in people's faces. Like, that's, that is like, also, it's like, I don't care what you say. These critics are esteemed critics. And if you've watched movie critics enough, enough you know they love shitting on movies. So yeah. like I, I got that I got into that argument a lot of people with Bright uh, when people were like, well the audience scores all this. I was like, yeah, because the audience that that's that's the kind of the weird place you get in with like action mystical movies is audiences are willing to like turn off their brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like they and then like uh, one is like people are just so busy trying to be woke and it's like yeah, but there's like really like good points on how the foundation of this movie is insulting to people of color. Like right. just yes. the simple thought- foundation. <laughs> yeah. Well, that and then also just like uh, y'all second episode in a row we're shitting on Brian. I don't give a fuck. Uh, <laughs> um lazy world building where it's like y'all I got a pitch for a movie. What if you walked into a Taco Bell and it's a Taco Bell and there's people eating and the guy behind the counter is a guy. But the guy next to you is an orc. Yeah. And no, that's it. <laughs> that's the world. It's our world, but there's uh, orcs. <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing: is like, is like, there's this new combative attitude towards like liking a thing that's like, poorly reviewed. <laughs> totally. it's like, yeah. You know, that's what they used to call cult <laughs> movies. That yeah, that, yeah. Like, a very welcome thing is like you can like bad movies. You there's nothing oh, wrong yeah. with it. You can like a fundamentally flawed movie. And still enjoy it, and that's your thing to like because everything of uh, art is subjective. Yeah. Uh, yes. And and that's fine. But now it's this: we're in the era of everyone feels like they have to be right, and so if there's not enough things confirming their bias, then of course that has to be wrong, or there's yeah. some conspiracy to ruin this movie, or because it's, it's like no. Bright is a fundamentally bad movie, but you can also enjoy a fundamentally bad built movie. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think there's also a thing. I think we are of uh, of a generation where it's like our parents. I'm sure there were some people like this, but the internet didn't exist. But we seem to also like so tie in 
our self identities with the things we like, yeah. like products and things of that nature. Yeah. And so therefore someone's saying they, whatever they thought of some product, it's not that you didn't like Batman. You're insulting me because I love Batman. Yeah. So fuck yeah. you. And rather than like, I feel like I'll be honest. And maybe it's growing up both a horror movie fan and a wrestling fan. I'm used to people not liking the shit I like. <laughs> so people are like, that's garbage. I'm like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes people, they love a genre so much they yes. unapologetically love everything in that genre of course, especially yeah. like sci-fi fantasy and like you know women have had to deal with that rom-coms are mostly awful forever yeah. and we know that i was sick a month or two ago and i watched bridget jones's baby on netflix it's awful <laughs> i enjoyed it yeah anyone tells me it's awful i'm not gonna go yeah. how dare you i agree it like, <laughs> but it was on netflix <laughs> yeah. it was on netflix and it served its purpose it was there knew how many fools go fanfics elizabeth has it's it would blow your mind she, <laughs> fool's gold is her jam she really loves fool's gold she's all about that matthew mcconaughey <laughs> it's, it's fool's gold is stuck in my head because i when i was living in long beach yeah. and i would drive home uh i would get off on atlantic and you would drive down this hill and every time you drove down this hill there was a, a big, billboard bi big billboard and so when fool's gold was out every time I would drive home right before I would sleep I would see fool's gold <laughs> and I was like fool's gold is that, is that one of the billboards from the Matthew McConaughey can't stand up oh, series yeah. have you seen oh, it he's just where like it's like he's on everybody. just propped up oh. on yeah. women <laughs> Oh, Lord. As we held up. Uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of mostly the news uh, that kind of happened this week. There's obviously little yeah. other things, but... Um, we we're going to talk about Han Solo, but apparently there's a trailer coming on Super Bowl Sunday now, so... Ooh. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. We'll, so, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, so, yeah, um, and uh, that's kind of that season, time of year, usually around Oscar season, there's not that much big news, because, like, the big yeah. summer movies, we already know they're coming, what they are. This is usually the time of year when indie films are getting made. Uh, so now we're just kind of in this fun... Little waiting period, yeah, uh, to see if any news breaks about like so and so's just been cast, or mm -hmm. they're talking to this director and things this, of that nature. This is usually when, like, you know, phase two Cineverse after this successful year of this Cineverse, y'all all will have Sundance passes, and this is when you would be oh, talking please. about all the movies that you saw at Sundance. <laughs> Yeah, well, we did. We did. Yes, in let's do all that. I know, I'm all for that. In YouTube, guys, uh, we did hear some of you. You guys want to see more trailer reactions. Uh, we did do some for uh, one for Mute and one for Hereditary. Mm -hmm. uh, so go check those out. As far as bringing them onto the show, we're trying to figure out if that's something we can do. We're talking yeah, behind the maybe. scenes and stuff. I, I, I like the idea of doing them independently just because it allows just to like focus on that. Yeah. But I think maybe, yeah, I think there's an opportunity to potentially like bring back certain trailers or, you know. Mm -hmm. things Talk, of that nature yeah exactly yeah well we're always open to doing whatever it's like a pretty loose format here it's mostly just like we want to just passionately discuss movies and if it happens to be a trailer mm -hmm. i'm all for it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh so i guess what maybe required viewing would be the first thing before we get into our two main big reviews uh, I mean, if you want to go that way, sure. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Fine with that. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, so, guys, this uh, week's required viewing is Detroit. Uh, that was Elizabeth's pick. Elizabeth, tell us about Detroit, why you picked it. Uh, I picked it just because there were, like, some phenomenal performances in there. Uh, but was, like, a really amazing director. Um, and it just was completely lost in August. And everyone kind of forgot it happened. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of one of those films that if it had had some more press and you know, been released at a better time, could have definitely been an Oscar contender in a few categories. And um, also, you know, hugely historical important event and interesting to talk about how that was handled. It's a very powerful film. One of those films you may not want to see twice. Right. But uh, I went to see it at a screening where um, a few of the stars talked afterwards about the process uh, and how they got to meet, uh, I know, uh, John's uh, security guard character uh, was named melvin i forget his last name but he met him he flew to detroit and spent a few days talking to the guy and uh just kind of the process of them going through uh that uh performance as an actor which right out the gate sounds like a very british actor thing to yeah, do that's <laughs> i'm gonna, I'm that gonna live true. with this man for a while <laughs> i'm going to go visit him and uh i don't know why I went with it's very uh, british okay. but i have an african accent yeah, yeah. you just gotta do him from yeah. uh so british i'm african you just gotta do him from attack the block like hey oh, bro yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, i'm just going to go to 
Detroit and meet up with these guys. Uh, Steve went right back, <laughs> saying whatever. No, it's fair though. So uh, I don't know if, if he knows this on the uh, like uh, episode two weeks ago on Roguelike, uh, which is our uh, improv RPG show that you all should watch on Friday nights. Uh, someone paid for me to play your character from Vanquished, yeah. so I tried to do every, and it was so bad. <laughs> I tried to do that voice, and I was like, "You guys want you paid for me to be happy? I'm doing what I can." <laughs> Oh Don't ever watch it, Iffy. <laughs> Some people are like, this is terrible. And I'm like, I know. I know. <laughs> oh, man. I will say, like, right after that, they asked, um, oh, God, what's his name? The British actor who plays the villain. Oh, uh, oh Will, Will Poulter. Poulter. Will Poulter. They were like, someone in the audience raised their hand and is like, did you meet the person your character is based on? And he's like, uh, no. No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to either. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the story of the film, uh, it's, uh, screenplays by Mark Ball, who had written uh, uh, Zero Dark Thirty and Hurt Locker uh, for Catherine Bigelow. Um, and the story is about the Detroit riots uh, and uh, what started it and then a particular night it's, the film's almost broken up into three acts, where it's like the first act is very much like the start of the riot, where it goes from there. Act yeah. two is almost kind of like a horror film in the, in the hotel yeah. uh, with the, inter- the brutal interrogations. And then act three is the aftermath and the trial, the trial yeah. and uh, things of that nature. Um, yeah, so I, uh, Liz- Elizabeth saw this at the screening. Uh, I watched it for the first time today. Um, it was ten dollars on iTunes, which was also all the special features and everything. So I was mm-hmm. like, "Well, what the hell? I'll just buy it." Yeah, because it was like five ninety nine to rent it. I'm like, "What's well, yeah. th- three yeah, more bucks?" Yeah. yeah, three more bucks. Um, yeah, I I really like the movie. I understand a lot of the controversy mm-hmm. behind the film, uh, which I think we'll we'll speak about as we get more into it. Uh, but I really liked it. I love the way it was shot. Um, I a lot of the characters and the different arcs. Um, I really loved following the guy who was playing the lead singer for the Dramatics. Yeah. Uh, even though the film was really and understandably very heavily pushed as it as if uh, John Boyega was the lead, I would actually say it's that oh, yeah. guy. It's that mm-hmm. character, the singer uh, character, because he's the one that wraps up the film. Uh, and John Boyega doesn't appear until I think like fifty minutes yeah, into the movie. Yeah. yeah, there's a long chunk before you meet John Boyega. Um, Will Will Pol- like all the actors do a, a really great job. It's it is hard to watch. Um, I understand a lot of people, uh, and I completely get it when they say the reason they avoided the movie is because they knew it'd be tough. Uh, especially people saying that they just didn't want to watch another movie about uh, uh, black torture, kind of the thing. Especially when it's happening in the news. Totally understand that. Um, but yeah, it felt like a very powerful movie. Uh, it it's. I have some qualms here and there uh, on a, on a bit of a script level, but uh, generally, yeah, I really, really uh, enjoyed it, and it is a powerful film. Yeah, I mean, that's I didn't really know what to expect from that movie, and I kind of expected the same thing that John Boyega was really going to be like the main character driving the whole movie, and we we're right. going to be following him mostly, and sort of the characters and people that he interacts with that night. But it was really interesting to see how, yes, we get to see all these different perspectives, but we do follow this lead singer of this band, which. You wouldn't think that that would be really the main character you would follow. It's kind of like the most awkward, not awkward, but like the most ridiculous sort of scenario where like, well, we're following the lead singer of a band through this riot. Through of, a, this, like, of a real band, by the way. Yeah, People yeah, yeah. Don't know the they, were like, they were like a pretty big hit in the in the 70s when they got their start. But, yeah. And he end, he actually ends up never joining the band back. He never goes back to the band, which is he stays in the choir, which was kind of sad. Like, I love at the end of the movie where they sort of recap and tell you where these people are today. It was really interesting, but it was really powerful. So we did watch three movies, and of the three movies, this is the one. There's a couple moments in this movie that, like, really emotionally hit me hard. And I'm watching, and I'm like, God, yeah, I can totally see how, for people watching this in the theater, how it can be really tough to watch. Yeah. But the, And it's the performances... And yeah, like there are little things with the script, but it's the performances drive that movie so hard. And you're spending a big chunk of this movie in this motel hallway. Mm -hmm. And I did not know that the movie was going to be that much of that. But it's like the intensity. Every single scene, it goes like higher and higher and higher. Well, because it's interesting because the film, the first half and then the the, the first act and then the third act kind of jump time a lot where it's like this happened two weeks later, three weeks later. The, The third act is like, two years later because you see the musician move from different to different locations yeah. uh where it's like that wasn't his house two scenes ago and now he's living somewhere else so you get this feeling of like time is really moving but then that second act is like it is a condensed like one night chunk yeah. of the film uh and yeah i mean it is it's not it's not it's not an easy watch uh you feel a lot of ang- <laughs> anger uh towards what's happening understandably um and yeah i, I think like 
it, and it, meeting these characters and where they come in, someone, uh, a reviewer said it kind of has like a mosaic feel to it where you're kind of going from thing to thing yeah. until it finally focuses into this and then spreads out again. Uh, and yeah, so I, I, it was, it's, it's one of those films where you're like, it sits with you after yeah. you've watched it and you're like, oh man, kind of a thing. Totally. Um, and it is, it is, it is a, it's a tough story to tell, and that's where, uh, understandably, uh, and by the way, uh, just just to say, if people are watching, waiting to be like, "What did Ify think? You guys need to stop talking." You didn't get to see this yeah, one. Yeah, I didn't get. I didn't even get the memo to watch this. One. That was my bad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that was my bad. I know. I know. That was one hundred percent my bad. Um, I, I texted him yesterday. I was like, "Hey, man, you want to be on the show? We're gonna talk about Shape of Water." And uh, call, uh, me call me by your name. I totally forgot to mention Detroit. <laughs> uh, so that was one hundred percent my bad. Yeah. Um, a lot of the controversy about the film came from um, both uh, Catherine Bigelow and Mark Bull being white uh, people, white filmmakers. Uh, and a lot of the controversy came from white filmmakers telling what feels like uh, African American story and the African American struggle. Um, a lot of people feel that there was a number of things that were uh, either cleaned up or missed because they don't have those uh experiences uh so that's something that i definitely cannot because I, I don't have those experiences either so i can't tell anybody they are right or wrong or, or anything it's not something you tell someone you're they're right or wrong about um i can only talk about my experience watching the movie which i was which again was like powerful stuff yeah i feel like <laughs> i feel like there was a silence like all right if he you know, said, but i feel like yeah, there, <laughs> it's a very, these prompt problems are like nuanced and definitely on and first off and foremost no one's ever in the wrong for like airing that concern no and i think you know you do have to kind of tread lightly when you are like telling a story as an outsider and you can't really do that i mean you know in a perfect world i'd like to imagine that you know these writers did do the due diligence and it seems like you know john went and talked to the actual security guard and hopefully that in its way is how it filters back and uh and and, and you know definitely in their performances they get to tell that story um I do feel there is a level in which, you know, um, and, you know, we're working to change it every day where it's like we're not as, as in we're like, you know, people of color creators aren't getting the chance to tell the story because they're not getting the opportunities to make these and that studio should often look for that. But, you know, good on, you know, the, you know, white creators who, who want to kind of spread this message out and to tell a different story about black struggle um without leaning on like slave stories i feel mm -hmm. like there's a million and one slave movies and that's definitely an easy oscar thing mm -hmm. i mean that is like the double-edged blade of like black struggle stories is you wonder if it's a story because they're trying to share this unique black story or if you know it's like an easy oscar nom mm -hmm. uh, because the black struggle always will at least get you a nomination here mm -hmm. or there uh but you know i feel like we're working to change that especially you know with you know get out getting noms you yeah know? And, and we the more like get outs big six that we get that kind of balance out balance out like struggle movies and you have just you know people of color just falling in love going through regular things or through a hyper uh genre genre you know heavily explored uh and heightened you know horror movie like that like you get to play with the medium in a mm -hmm. way so so yeah it, it is it is i think no one you know no one's ever wrong for expressing there and i feel like it is when you think about it there is like a level to it to where like white people have been telling our stories for so long that i feel like now as we move forward there's kind of like an ownership that is hoping to be taken back from by people of color where it's like okay you know i get what what, what you're trying to do and good on you but like now that we're starting to have a seat at the table let us kind of tell these stories mm -hmm. or like at least you know you want to write it maybe co-write it with a person of color yeah and then help uplift that voice and then you know you still get your oscar nom <laughs> and you also get to help out this uh you know person of color writer yeah i feel like detroit could have been a really good opportunity for Catherine bigelow to come in maybe as like a producer yeah or like help write with mark bowl oh yeah be maybe sign on as director and then you know sort of be like well let's let's like tell the story 
from a different perspective. Let's get a, a director of color, like an, yeah. you know, like an Ava DuVernay or like whoever, yeah. whoever was available to make it, and then still like really support them and push oh, for yeah. them to really like stay on as a producer, help them get the project made, and all yeah. that. Yeah, and, and it, it is kind of a bummer that the movie sort of got swept under. You know, it came and went. It really it did. came and went. It premiered, I think, in the first week of August, and we had just got out of Comic Con. Dunkirk had just come out, and like, yeah. if you're competing, if you're a little movie from Annapurna is competing with a Warner Brothers Paramount Pictures major release yeah, by Christopher Warner Nolan. Movie, yeah. I mean, yeah, you are kind of set up for failure, which sucks because yeah. it would have been great if the movie came out in like October when there was a little less maybe happening. And right. It could have had, you know, sort of the due that it deserved. And yeah, and it, it is a bummer because as tough as that story is to, to probably tell and watch and obviously like the movie very much tells you that some of it is a work of fiction because well a big part of that too is because they did yeah. uh zero dark 30 right and uh, they got uh, mark vola and Catherine yeah. Riglow, and they got so much heat for zero dark 30 yeah that uh like the, <laughs> the minute the movie's over before the credits it's like uh this is a work of fiction that we could put together best by the accounts of people who are still alive yes. in there <laughs> yeah. by trying yeah. to be like, don't come out. <laughs> right. And I mean, it's like, it's, it's so difficult. <laughs> Which to I do. totally get. Yeah. But, it, and it's like, it's so difficult to do these types of movies because yes, everyone expects you to be hundred percent accurate. But yeah, if you're doing a story like that, where there isn't someone there with a camera and yeah. someone's not recording every single thing that happens, you do have to kind of interpret some of it. Also, it's just yeah. like every other, um, every like sitcom that has like the, multiple accounts bit which is one of my favorite uh yeah. tv bits ever is like everyone has a different version of the story that they need to tell like for example when straight out of compton came out and easy's daughter came out and was like oh i don't like the way they portrayed mm. my dad and like you know they they played no vaseline but they never played like easy's like reply and it's like well yeah because it's not his movie right you got it like and I and you know it made so much sense because like yeah that's your dad like in in your vision of NWA your dad was the hero of, of that movie right it's like but you one just when you're covering so many people in a movie there uh, some stories are going to be swept out uh swept under the rug but it's kind of the same thing that that you talked about last week Elizabeth when we talked about I Tanya it's people are coming at I Tanya because of sort of what it's trying to depict. And I think people are kind of forgetting, like, it's all about the perspective of, you know, well, whose perspective is the movie, mm -hmm. the story kind of being told from. So, yeah, it's like with that, you're kind of just getting Tanya Harding's story. Yeah. This movie is kind of telling perspective from certain characters. And it like because of the topic and what it is, it's, yeah, you're not going to yeah. get on 100% oh, representation. I, I, I definitely want to jump in and talk about I, Tanya, too, real quick, because there's so many articles that's like saying, like, oh, it's making Tanya out to be a hero and it's not really given nancy kerrigan and you know it's like yeah the movie's called yeah, i Tanya. Tanya. Like, not like i nancy that's, that's the weirdest take i've been seeing where it's like <laughs> where, and i see that take a lot of times where it's like you know this person is like being talked about the most but we're not talking about this person and their influence on the ice skating industry it's like no this is i tanya this is about tanya hardy yeah. this story it's not us tanya like, nancy this story <laughs> is like a big light shown on the fact like i think a lot of people didn't know that tanya didn't take the pipe to Nancy Kerrigan's knee. I think everyone, when they think of Tanya Harden, that's what they think of. Yeah. And this movie cleared that up. So, like, while you're saying, like, oh, boo-hoo, Nancy Kerrigan didn't get the light. Like, this woman was royally fucked over in a big way by her abusive husband, and that's being revealed in this movie, and you're still thinking about Nancy Kerrigan. Like, that's, the, that's why I, I, Tanya, was made. Like, just those posts like that. Yeah. Where... And I'm not, you know, making, you know, Tanya Hard not to be a saint. I don't know exactly what happened. But if, you know, but I, I do believe she definitely, if she did not take that pole to Nancy Kerrigan's knee, then she got a tough rap because she is, I, and I think history will always, hopefully after this movie, not as much, will look back as like she's the one who hit a Nancy Kerrigan in mm. the knee. Yeah, and it's also it's it's not like about Nancy Kerrigan because Nancy Kerrigan was like a girl with kind of more of a charmed life who came from a certain tier of wealth in society like most people did and Tanya Harding was the exception and yeah. why she didn't really ever fit in which ice skating from what I've heard is like one of the most expensive sports to oh, enroll your kid in. Oh yeah, that and hockey. So yeah. 
I mean, yeah, so I mean, it was very, very different from her. And yeah, no, it doesn't portray her as a saint at all. But like she had struggles that are very, very unique that Mm -hmm. came to a head in a really horrible way. Yeah. And I think what what I I do like is that the the conversation about the Troy people who are talking about it it is starting a conversation, uh, which is like how the story's told, who should tell certain stories, things like that. And I think that's a good conversation to have. Uh, I do want to touch on some of the things that I wasn't crazy about. Not that, oh, not, they were, not that they were terrible. Not that they were like, it ruined the movie or anything like that. Uh, but I will say, and it's only surprising because Mark Bowl, I think Zero Dark Thirty and uh, Hurt Locker had a lot of nuance to it. Yeah. Uh, and though this is uh, a very rough story and by taking by uh, true accounts there are like amalgamations like will porter's character is based on a couple cops Mm -hmm. he wasn't like a singular cop named this thing Mm. um there is a a a part of me that like i'm trying to think about how to put this uh he and his cohorts those cops were so evil like so mustache twirling evil and i have no doubt uh that those at all no doubt that those kind of cops exist and people in power exist like that Mm -hmm. no doubt and i'm not saying that he should have been nuanced or we didn't see a nice moment from him not at all but but the fact is is that we also see them doing stuff those same three cops doing stuff at the beginning to other people Mm -hmm. and i kind of think there might have been a wider story to tell if those things that those three cops did were done by other cops as a, in a way because it almost makes it look like if this makes any sense like um and maybe this is a simplified version of this like problematic police brutality and the treatment of black men is done by three evil cops <laughs> where i think there might have been more right. power in having will poulter do something in the beginning and then you never see that character again mm-hmm. and then you see three different cops or well, you know I think what i mean part of, part of the nuance of it was in the fact that they showed other people who weren't evil but then turned their heads which is yes, a very like bad true. thing to yeah. do they showed like um when they brought in i like nationals to deal with the riot like he came went to his boss and he's like something's happening there and it's not okay mm-hmm. and they're like it's not our jurisdiction we're leaving and they yeah. left him there and that sucks but like yeah it's yeah. i do think uh that is a good point though that you're <clears throat> making and something to be explored of just like there's this notion of like evil evil person equals evil cops and it kind of allows it to kind of look at a person by person basis and not really look at the institution as a whole and i would say even the other way where you do like i would love to see just you know i mean i didn't see it so i wouldn't have (laughs) but just based on like your complaints i do think there is a point to like showing that you know that you're not just like down the middle straight up evil cop evil you know what i mean like i think um i'm trying to think of what was that huge um almost misdirect we had in um in uh the tarantino movie oh uh with samuel jackson with uh, with in django no no the other one the other uh cowboy movie oh oh uh uh, where like i feel like that played with like your perception of people versus like what like how evil they actually were yeah and like i feel like that is the more but that's also in a sense a different movie i Mm. feel like when you're capturing like an event it you kind of don't want to focus too much and i feel like that's also what they wanted to avoid they didn't want to focus too much on the cops and just be like but they're but they, i feel like your concern is very valid and like by painting like these are bad cops wink i know? will say that it had a huge purpose by showing that particular cop who was by far and away the biggest problem and i found him totally terrifying and <laughs> oh i thought he was great i'm but, nothing but, against but, the actor i will say the first event when he uses unnecessary violence um and his uh i, I guess boss his like yeah, superior yeah superior, calls him in for it and like yells at him but leaves him on the force right and yeah does nothing and yeah. then this happens so that i think was kind of the point of him being responsible for the first thing the fact that he got you know yeah a slap on the wrist mm-hmm. yeah and i think there, there there's some of that i uh, and i don't disagree with that point at all i guess uh, to me and it's always easy to play you know uh side quarterback and go like oh you should have done blah blah Mo- uh, movies are a hard thing to make and sometimes 
it's only once they're done you'll go oh i could have done and i've had that in sketches that are three pages long <laughs> a month later i'm like i should have put this in there <laughs> i didn't yeah. think about it not even to make it funnier just to make it cleaner um and i think will porter's great but i, I think like the only thing i think for me because i agree the national guard some of the other uh police force that are kind of like this isn't our problem and they leave i kind of uh, it's it's a hard character but i think like I always think about how brilliant and it's so simple the Benedict Cumberbatch character was in 12 Years a Slave mm. as the nice slave master and how Michael Fassbender so evil yeah. and so, you know, violent and what we would think of. And Benedict Cumberbatch is like, oh, I, I, I don't beat my slaves. I'm, I'm the good one. And it's like, no, you're still a slave, you're owner, still a slave owner and yeah. you're still super complicit in this. What can I do? What yeah. can I? That's that's the, that's the world. Mm. And I'm like, oh, you're almost more of a monster than the guy who straight up <laughs> owns it. Yeah. And I feel like this movie had the straight up own it guy, but it didn't have that character. It was like, oh, hey. really? <laughs> I would say that was the dumb one. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. I don't know. Like I, he's the one who confesses. Yeah. True. No, that's true. Um, and I will say this was not a problem for me until retrospectively, but uh, it, it is. It, we see the horrible violence that they're inflicting. Uh, at first, we see them shoot two people. Yeah. And then the next three people that get killed, the camera cuts and we hear it, which is a fine cinematic trick. But I kind of wonder if there would have been more horror in seeing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like hitting the point. As opposed to using it as a cinematic trick to be like, I did what you told me. And they're like, well, we told you, what, what are you talking about? And then they look, open the door and there he's dead. Right. I'm kind of like, is there more power? Like, not that I want to see someone get killed, but is there, if, if the story you're trying to tell, is there more power in seeing the brutality take place yeah. than to just see the aftermath of it? Yeah. I mean, I, I, and was, I don't really answer that. There's just something uh, yeah, that's I was in my kinda, head. I was a little surprised when they sort of introduced that idea of like, we're not going to, we're, we're going to show it. And then we get to this, this particular character and. They don't show it, and I feel like it automatically signaled, oh, he actually really does get killed. Yeah. And I think maybe, yeah, maybe I would have felt more power instead of cutting away, being like, actually witnessing the brutality of it. I think it would probably hit me a little bit harder. Instead of cutting away, being like, oh, he actually really does kill him because he comes out, and you can immediately tell from his attitude that he actually just killed somebody. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, yeah, maybe it would have hit a little bit. But I think between showing a lot of the brutality... I think if maybe you would have shown this character actually being shot, I think maybe it would have been like already too much for somebody. I could, yeah, I can maybe, see that. maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, with all that said, I still really like the movie. I think it is a shame that's like has not like the whole award season. It's it's a bummer. It's really completely good. ignored. I think a lot yeah. of the actors do great, and in really small, like Anthony Mackie. Yeah. I think it's great in this movie. He's not really in it that much, no. but just like every actor who gets just a little bit to do. Uh, does a lot of great work. Again, I love the way it was shot. I did like, I did kind of, and this is just a, a taste thing. I did kind of like that cutting, stay with something, cutting thing. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of made it feel like a miniseries to some extent yeah. in a weird way. Totally. Yeah. Like I could have easily seen this on HBO as like a three hour miniseries event yeah. kind of uh, a thing. Said she had all the cameras built into the hallway. So the actors didn't have to worry about stepping over cameras or avoiding them. So oh, that's interesting. All like hidden behind oh, wow. panel. Oh. Um, but yeah, I th to wrap it up, I think I'm I'm recommending it again. I think it's I think it's worth seeing. So thank you, Elizabeth, for picking this one. Yeah, I want to watch it again. For sure. I don't know if I do. <laughs> <laughs> I I yeah, it's like it's not it's not a movie that I could watch tomorrow. Yeah. But I definitely would yeah, like to go re. Yeah. yeah, I definitely would want to go revisit it in like a couple months. After like we watch all these other Oscar movies, be like, okay, let me sit with this movie a little more and like, sort of just let it watch that and don't, don't, don't not watch anything for a couple of days and just sort of let it digest because it's there's a lot of power in in those scenes like when they're praying where he's yelling, Will Poulter's yelling at them to pray, and the guy from the band starts singing and like it just hits you like wave of emotion just hit you because you it feels so real it's almost terrifying. Yeah, and if yeah. you get around to seeing it, do let us know. Yeah, uh, give me some hot takes yeah <laughs> send up some of those tweets some spicy, yeah some spicy takes <laughs> uh but guys so that's going to be a required viewing for this week uh next week sticking along with the theme of movies you should have seen in 2017 uh it's gonna be my pick and i'm picking good time the robert pattinson movie yes. from the uh uh safety brothers i believe is their name I think so yeah uh and uh next week our guest is gonna be Ro uh, rochelle williams writer on survivor's remorse and her favorite movie of last year was Good Time. <clears throat> yeah. So very excited to get you her on you here. You and I saw in the theater together. And I saw the trailer and I was like, okay, maybe Rob Pattinson's going to do something that 
is a little unexpected, but yeah. it really was. I always poo poo on him, and I shouldn't. I shouldn't poo poo on any actor because there's, you know, even him and like even Kristen Stewart. A lot of people are like, oh, the Twilight kids. What do they know? Yeah. But I hear Personal Shopper is like a, re- a really good movie. It's a great performance. She was so. great in Clouds and Sills Maria. Yeah, yeah. So Good Time was really good. I really enjoyed that movie. Uh, so check that one out. Uh, I kind of like Detroit. I think you can get that on uh, Amazon or iTunes, uh, and I think it's worth checking out. Also yeah. because the movie. Uh, it might not have been the biggest hit in the world, but it got enough talk that I think the Safety Brothers' next film is supposed to be a remake of 48 Hours. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. oh is that what they're doing nice? Yeah. Uh, so that'll be very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll see if it's an actual remake or if it's one of the, <laughs> what we do now where it's a sequel remake yeah. Yeah. called 48 Hours. So Eddie Murphy could pop in as the character's dad. Yeah. <laughs> and just be like, this happened to me too. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> um, but let's go, let's move on to our reviews. Uh, so first, uh, first up, is The Shape of Water, directed by Guillermo del Toro, uh, written by Guillermo del Toro, starring uh, and an, uh, another Melissa writer. Taylor. Yes. Um, and starring uh, Sally Hawkins, Richard Jenkins, Michael Shannon, Doug Jones, and Olivia, um, Octavia Spencer. Octavia Spencer. Um, this one has the most nominations of any film in the Academy Awards. Yeah, 13. Uh, the film is about a, a mute uh janitor cleaning woman yeah they're like yeah they're cleaning crew uh yeah. cleaning crew for a government facility and a fish creature that michael shannon as an fbi agent brings in and uh she develops a kinship with the creature and then tries to save it once she hears that they are going to kill it mm-hmm. yeah Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Michael Stuhlbar as a scientist. And uh, both movies star Michael Stuhlbar, and uh, it was not intentional when we picked these films, but yeah. he's in both movies. Uh, yeah, he probably should have got some recognition for his performances, because they were all good. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah he, really good. Good both. he was yeah. great. Uh, Does he just speak, like, every language? Uh, apparently, maybe. <laughs> <Is that why laughs> I looked at his IMDb, movies? he's born in, like, Long Beach. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I thought you were, like, I thought you were born in, like, Germany or yeah. Austria, uh, Austria or something. I'm like, no, you're from California. You're a local boy. Wow. <laughs> Uh, so if it going to you, what did you think of the shape of water? Oh, I loved it. I was I was in. I I love it. It was so funny because here we go. Uh, because like I often I I saw it very close to when I uh, forced myself to sit through Bright with my mom and like I <laughs> was this a mom pick? It was Bright yeah, a mom pick? Was, of course, it was a mom pick. It wasn't a me pick. Um, <laughs> And like, in like, I feel like they both are trying to accomplish the same thing, which is to melt the mystical world with the real world. Mm. And I feel like Shape of Water is a feat in how you could do it in a great way. And mm. I, I feel like th- thematically, that's the closest you can get to shaping the, you know, melding those two worlds. But besides that, they are pretty different. Mm. But I really like it. I like, you know, and. And a good friend of mine, Demi, uh, uh, very against Shape of Water. I don't know what his, <laughs> what his beef is with, I think he just doesn't like magic. Because uh, <laughs> that's what that movie was. It was great magic. It yeah. was beautiful. Uh, I really like the pacing of it all. Uh, you know, uh, like, he, he had a point that I actually thought was good until, like, I spoke to my... Uh, good friend Kyle about his take because he felt that the Russian subplot did not need it to be there. It was totally unneeded. Mm. It wasn't there. But then Kyle mentioned that, yeah, it was, it was a MacGuffin. Like you, you were thinking based following the story that since the, the U S were going to kill the monster, that obviously Russia is probably going to try and save it. But mm-hmm. then you find out, no, that's not true. They want to mm-hmm. kill it too. Mm-hmm. So now you get a, a double fake out. And you create this even more intense situation, and there is like a sense of urgency since you're like, "Oh shit, two people are trying to kill this yeah. this monster. How? What are we gonna do?" And I and like you know, in the whole, <laughs> oh, Demi hated the like scene with the water where they fill up the room the bathroom the bathroom. Yeah. I loved yeah. it. At that, like, I did too. Like, I thought that was great. Yeah, yeah it's like well, like why are you nitpicking a movie with a fish man? Like right. it's like. Yeah. The, like once the fish man is there, once you've accepted the fish man, you don't get to be nitpicking. Right. There's a fish man yeah. here. So yes, we can put a towel under the door and the room will fill with water. There's a fish man who may be a god. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Which like which they kind of pointed that out. He is he, you know, obviously, you know the spoilers are coming. He brings her back to life <laughs> right. in the end. Yeah. So at that point, 
Yeah, motherfucker. He can he can make a room filled with water. He probably used his god fish powers to make that happen. Seal up all the doorways. Yeah, yeah. Once you once you add magic to a movie, you get full justification because it's like, yeah, it's magic. Right. Yeah. Uh yeah, I, I love the movie. Uh almost from like minute two, like yeah. her and Richard Jenkins when they're watching that musical together oh, and they start that. doing that little so great. He's amazing in that. This movie with both Richard Jenkins and Michael Stuvar, I'm like, Oh, you hired all you hired the two actors who make every scene amazing, but they do the most minimal thing to yeah. make it amazing. Yeah. Like it's just so in it. They're yeah. so natural. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I loved, uh, and, and how the movie's just so much about outsiders, Richard Jenkins being uh, uh, a homosexual yeah. who gets like re- violently rejected at that uh, restaurant. Yeah. pie shop. Yeah. yeah and you get yeah, to see yeah. the true nature of that guy and how he treats. Well, that was so such a like, actually, 180. Was but that was such a good subplot too, yeah. because how he was very dismissive of like the black plight going on at yeah. the time and he was in the same boat like i felt like that was such a nice neat package hidden message that i think is slept on like is how like we're all in this together and if you think you're going to ignore one person's plight you'll be surprised to find that it's often going to be yours too yeah yeah and i love after his reaction to her and the bathtub and standing there naked with <laughs> yeah. and he just kind of goes yeah, for <laughs> yeah. For all the talk about the movie, uh, the sex with the fish man and stuff, and all that, I love that Octavia Spencer too was just like, "How does that work?" Right. Huh. Just, <laughs> just, oh, that, which, was, that was the most relieving, like, yes, yeah. thing. Because I was like, "Yeah, no, I was definitely wondering how right. does that go." And then it's like, "Okay, it's a retractable, retractable penis." Uh, for <laughs> those who may be wondering, <laughs> yeah, and I think Sally Hawkins is uh, Sally Hawkins has always been great, but she's really great in this. Oh, the uh, fantasy musical sequence with her and the and the fish man uh, doing like a, a old uh, yeah. old uh, kind of Fred Astaire thing mm-hmm. was so great. I love the B- Busby Berkeley kind of thing. I, it, it just felt like you can tell Guillermo del Toro is like a movie fan, and I feel like this is the movie where he's like, I'm gonna do all the stuff yeah. I've wanted to do. No Why one's not? gonna let me make a musical, so I'm gonna exactly. put a musical scene in this, yeah. and now I wanted to put this in here. Uh, and this. He did the thing where he uh, he visually said the name of the movie instead of saying the name of the yeah. movie mm-hmm. with like she's like following the the pattern of the rain on the bus oh, and yeah. then the shot filters and it's just this beautiful little shot and it's just yeah he's just does stuff like that throughout the whole film it's yeah that's the cat being eaten the cat i know, the cat being eaten. <laughs> I know the, but then richard jenkins no 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 no, no. Yeah. he's like well that's I, I think that's what i loved about that movie so much was yeah like when they go into the bathroom and they fill up with water i'm like oh this is a little okay a little a little ridiculous and then the musical scene i'm like this is a little ridiculous and then, like we get towards the end of the movie i'm like He's a fucking fish man. Like, yeah. what was I expecting this to be? <laughs> yeah. He's not trying to be realistic. But it's like, the movie's built so beautifully. The production design, the costumes, the way that facility looks. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, it's great. Yeah, like, it feels very modern oh, and, and like, a very each time. Like, almost like C plot with the car. I love oh, yeah, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, buying the fancy car and just oh, all yeah. this shit happened to yep. the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Michael Shannon, I mean, I, I love Michael Shannon mostly anything oh, yeah. that he does, but he's always. Beginning of the movie seems like a very kind of like th- this very fake sort of sweet guy. Then you see how big of a piece of shit is when he's torturing the oh, sea yeah. creature. Yeah. But then like he elevates to another level when he gets to the end of the movie when he's in Octavia Spencer's apartment and he's, you know, mm-hmm. basically just trying to get it out of her. Where is this, there this like creature? He's ripping his fingers about off. It, like all the time, like when he comes home to his wife and yeah. then he's like, don't talk. <laughs> yeah. 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 And he covers oh, her with his fingers I and his, his fingers throughout the whole movie. Oh. Gross! It's like all infected and nasty. Black by the end, oh, and he rips God. them off. So gross. That's the thing about the El Toro too. <laughs> I love that. No matter what he makes, the violence in his movies are always so gross, yeah. and I yeah. love that yeah. he'll still, even though this beautiful romantic film about the, you know, we're all in this together and outsiders, he'll still be like, oh yeah, he's gonna grab Michael Schoolbar through his cheek oh. with the bullet hole and pull him. <laughs> That was ridiculous. I didn't realize that you got shot through the mouth, and then I see him grab him, just pick him up. So Ugh. did you guys see the, I don't know if you, either any of you saw it at the Arclight. They did the no. little post-interview with um, Del Toro, and he said he's had this idea for this movie vaguely in his head since he saw The Creature for the Black Lagoon, the classic, yeah. at age six. And there's a scene where she's swimming in a white bathing suit above the water, and the creature's just swimming parallel beneath her. And like as a six-year-old, he looked at that and went, oh, I hope they end up together. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's amazing. That's so good. Um, I love Octavia Spencer about this whole movie. I think is great too. Oh, she's, she's so good great. as this like supportive friend character yeah. who's just like with her the entire way through. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she tells her husband to sit down and shut up at the end. Oh, yeah. Like you haven't talked for years. Now you can't yeah, stop yeah, talking. Now you got something to say. That sit down. This line. Oh yeah. my gosh, it's so good. Well, I love it. I love how she has this moment where she's not sure if she wants this to go through, and she's trying to stop her from wheeling the creature out mm -hmm. and then finally gets to the point where she's like all right let's go let's just yeah. go let's just go i'm like oh damn that's someone who definitely like has your back yeah yeah, yeah. it's great 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 character building great relationships cinematography was beautiful the music is great like there really was nothing i didn't enjoy this in this movie like everything just kind of fires on all cylinders yeah the pace of it it just like really flowed well like yeah. it's kind of one of those movies where i'm like and it, what i love about a movie like this and I feel like Del Toro, and there's a few other directors who can do this kind of thing, is it kind of has this dream pace to it. it does, like, yeah. it just kind of feels like it goes from scene to scene very sm smoothly, even with the Michael Shannon stuff. And I also, you know, the cinematography of the movie is it's got that classic Del Toro cinematography where he's like green, blue, and yellow, except for all the Michael Shannon scenes, which are filmed like a Norman Rockwell, mm -hmm. very high key yeah. kind of a thing to give yeah. you that classic Americana feel yeah. to it. I was also surprised that the movie, I, I, Almost thought that the movie was going to go from her meeting the creature. I mean, she meets him pretty early. It's pretty like 20 quick, yeah. minutes into the movie, and already they're like communicating and all that kind of stuff, which I thought was also cool how they communicate through sign language. That was interesting oh, yeah. for them like to develop that. But then she rescues the creature, and the creature never goes back into the facility. And I feel like most movies, when you watch that sort of a thing where it's like a, a kidnapping or a rescue, the, the creature or the thing always gets kidnapped. They capture it again. Ca captured and brought back. And it just prolongs the story. And I love that this just kind of was like, creature gets out, and then the creature escapes, and that's kind of it. It's like they, yeah. they never catch the creature. And I like that, that it just kind of gets to the point and doesn't drag out. Yeah. I love the the guy who works at the uh, company who's like such the biggest ass kiss uh, for, yeah. of Michael Shannon. Isn't that Bradley Whitford? Uh, no, not Bradley Whitford. No, I don't think it was Bradley. It looked like him. I can't remember that actor's name, but I know I've seen that actor in other yeah. movies. Yeah, but I loved him uh, when the creature gets out, and Michael Shannon's like, "We don't need to tell so and so," and he's like, "I already called him." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then the scene when Michael Shannon's like, "Get out of the car," and he's like, "Get out of my, my car." car. Yeah, he's like, "It's my car." And Michael Shannon's like chewing on, I think, like a mint or something, and the guy's like, "What's that smell?" Oh, sir, your fingers—they smell terrible. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I really, really enjoyed this movie. Uh, it, it seems to currently, to you know, a month or so out, it seems to be the odds-on favorite to win Best Picture. Uh, Del Toro seems the odds-on favorite to win Best Director, um, and so uh, that that I wouldn't mind that of the different combinations of that that could happen. Um, yeah, I mean, I love Guillermo del Toro, and also like the thing about it is like after Pacific Rim did okay, but not great. I mean, it's getting a sequel, but. You know, a lot of people were like, well, that's because China, America didn't seem to care about the first Pacific Rim. And then uh, Crimson Peak came out and a lot of people seemed very disappointed in that. Yeah. There almost kind of seemed to be like, hey, has has Del Toro lost that right. juice, that kind of thing? You know, and now this comes out and it's like, oh, no, he's got it. Just and let him make his passion project made for like, what, 16 million or something? Yeah. It's some like insanely low budget. Yeah. yeah. And it looks like it's it looks amazing. Yeah. Like it looks like they spent a lot of money on it. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's like, that's so impressive to me that he was able to make that movie. I mean, that suit that Doug Jones wears is amazing. And yeah. like, it has very little CG enhancements. Oh, yeah. Or maybe it has a lot. I don't know. You can't tell, though. It's so seamless. Uh, I read that it was a uh, very cold <laughs> that's it's like and they filmed it and i forget where they filmed it but it was just very cold i think in toronto wet. and so mm. because they wanted that skin tight quality and mm. they wanted it to be realistic it's like has nothing and then of course um doug uh what's his name it's, jones he has like no fat on his body yeah so basically the um the maker of the suit and another guy would basically between cuts just run at him with a blanket <laughs> here here yeah we're so sorry oh, to toronto's, oh, toronto's cold yeah. <laughs> here you go yeah um yeah so uh shape of water i think we're all saying go see it for sure yeah. oh yeah 100 um, yeah. percent. and let us know in the comments what you thought of this one um so let's move on to the next michael stuvar film <laughs> Which, so great again unintentional uh call me by your name um based on a book uh starring army hammer and timothy chalamet yeah. 
um, and uh, a number of uh, Italian actors. Uh, and the uh, <laughs> <laughs> how dare you? Come yeah. on, couple get their of names, uh, right? A couple of Italian actors, uh, and I want to look up the director's name of this. The this director made um, "I Am Love," uh, starring um, um, oh, the name went right out of my head. <laughs> Some <laughs> Italian actors? Yeah, no, 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 no. It starred. Uh, uh, it stars. Um, oh man, people got mad at her because she played the. Uh, Wizard and Doctor Strange. <laughs> oh, Tilda Swinton? Tilda Swinton. T Swins? Yeah. Mm. I Am Love, uh, starring Tilda Swinton. His next movie, which is fascinating, is a remake of Suspiria. Oh. The horror film. Interesting. Uh, which, uh, when it was announced he was doing that, was before Call Me By Your Name came out. And a lot of people went, oh, that's perfect because of I Am Love. I Am Love is this very like extreme, crazy movie about romance and all this other stuff. Uh, whereas, uh, if you said this was the director of Call Me By Your Name was doing Suspiria, I think it gets that response. People are like, Interesting, uh, and I'm like, no, go see the other movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Luca Luca Gagandio is his name, the director. Um, so uh, the movie is about uh, it's 1983 Italy, uh, and it's about a, a young man named Elio, and uh, his father Michael Stuvar is a professor, seemingly of like Greek art or classic art. Uh, and every summer they they uh, take on uh, an apprentice or a student, and this year it's uh, Army Hammer is Oliver. Uh, staying with them for the summer, and it kind of turns into this blossoming romance uh, between these two, and this kind of, to some extent, will they, won't they, while also looking at the Italian countryside. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, that's, sort of, that's sort of it. It's not really yeah. a film about plot. It's not really a plot movie. Uh, they He shows up, they meet, hour or so, yeah. they finally seem to like each other. To some, there's this kind of like, well, I was avoiding you, you were avoiding me, right. blah, blah, blah. They sleep together movie kind of goes and then he, he leaves summer's over and he leaves yeah i the thing i really aside from wanting to desperately go to italy now after watching that movie <laughs> yeah it it kind of felt like it was just yeah the movie doesn't really re rely on time or anything it's just it takes place over the course of the summer but you don't really feel that it literally feels like it's something that takes place in a 24-hour period and you're just you're kind of just in these characters life yeah and just see how their life kind of unfolds for like a day or two and it's so like well done i don't know like it's i did not expect again like shape of water i did not expect this movie to sort of play out like it does because these two characters that are essentially in love with each other they go off to another city and then they part ways and that's the end there is no they like right off into the sunset sort of a thing. yeah there's no like, oh, interesting. what i honestly when i saw the movie took place in 1983 i was waiting and it doesn't happen which i found very refreshing i was waiting for that moment where the parents find out he's gay yes and they're furious or they're I was upset totally or all that. that and it doesn't happen and no. i think actually i will say this i really love this movie the first hour and a half is gorgeous i think it's beautiful it takes its time mm. it's very deliberately paced why i think people are talking about this movie are the last three scenes mm. i think there is a conversation scene between Elio and his father, Michael Stolbar, yeah. that is so powerful. It's performed that so well. He's, Michael Stolbar steals the whole movie with this one Unbelievable, scene. Yeah. Uh, and then the very final scene at the fireplace. Uh, those two scenes, I think, are, and the movie's good, but those two scenes are so good that I feel like it almost elevates the movie and yeah. you just like leave there going, whoa, like you're devastated at the end of this movie because yeah. of those two scenes if those two scenes weren't there i think people would have walked away going like this is a very nice movie yeah, it looks yeah. great and it's very sweet and well acted i don't know if people would be talking about it I, I and that's also, not a, that's not a criticism of the first hour plus. i also really appreciate the opening and closing credits because yes. the closing credits it's just him staring at the fire at the fire mm -hmm. just crying like being extreme you can feel he's going through so many emotions right now because he just found out that oliver is like engaged and all this stuff and i think it's like it's really bringing out all this emotion and the opening is just sort of like nothing's happening it's just art with just names and it was kind of refreshing to just let a movie and the music just kind of like take you propel yeah, you into the I story like too and then yeah. later you learn it's pictures of the statue yeah, yeah yeah i mean i feel like uh you know saw a lot of this I mean, now i gotta rewatch uh to get the full package here um don't let my homie timothy know uh, <laughs> yeah, you worked with Timothy. It's worth saying. Yeah, yeah. if you worked yeah. with Timothy, tell us like three, three, four years ago, me and Timothy worked on a, a a short called Spinners, which was like probably a small moment of his life and career, which for me was way big because like I because at the time he just um he he was like I known him as he was the kid on Homeland, and on our drive up um 
Oh, uh, because we drew, we shot it in Joshua Tree on a mm-hmm. drive up. He was like a bit late, and we were like, "Oh, what's up?" He was like, "Yeah, I had a meeting for this other movie," and I was like, "Oh, word." He was like, "Yeah." Um, I was like, "He was like, it was the it was Christopher Nolan," and I was like, "What?" I was like, "You were, you were in the room with Christopher Nolan." He was like, "Yeah, he wants me in his movie Interstellar," and I was like, "Because he's the word? son, yeah." And then like so, the, I found so I knew he was going to be an Interstellar, and I was like geeked, and like. We did the film. He like watching him act was like because he was like very much an actor, actor. Mm-hmm. Like you'd see him like turn it on, um, and uh, and like that's when I was like, oh, this kid. Like seeing, knowing he was like so young, knowing he, he was about to do Interstellar, I'm like this kid is gonna blow yeah. up. And like we've kept in touch. Like we're not like super homies, but like in the same way that you know actors become friends on set, exchange <clears throat> numbers, text from time yeah. to time. But it's been interesting seeing like you know like it was like he'd be in town we'd hang out and stuff like that to like now he is like so busy and like i'm like all right when you get time hit, hit your boy up, <laughs> hit your boy up and like i'll look i'll look at like and he has like legitimately been like biz, like so busy like i don't have to be like oh is he is he fade me because like he'll be like he had a pick and he was in la and then, like, I was like, damn, homie, you in L.A.? He was like, yeah, I'll uh, hit you up uh, when I'm back in town. And then, like, I swear, like, two days later, he's in Italy. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> and, and doing, like, some more press yeah, promo yeah. for uh, a call me Biden. But, like, he's, he's you know, like, one of the coolest dude. Like, you know, like, I know a lot of people have been, like, seeing, like, him talk about, like, Frank Ocean and Cuddy. And they're like, oh, he's a, like, no, he is, like, legit, like, mm-hmm. geeked about those artists. Like, yeah. that's kind of what we bonded over. He's a big Cuddy guy. Um, but all, all that aside, uh, uh, sorry, Timmy, I didn't uh, see. <laughs> uh, like, I, I didn't see the movie you're first nominated first for an Academy yeah, Award yeah. for. Yeah, I, saw, I saw the first chunk. I saw enough to, like, send him a text of me playing, like, Migo's song over his name, <laughs> showing up in the credits. Uh, but... <laughs> But like, but I did see like a huge, like I've watched all the way up to like, I never got to the point where it was re- resolved. It was very much the early parts where he hates Oliver mm-hmm. and he like, he's so annoyed by him and like almost to the point where you don't know that they would even be attracted because yeah. like Oliver's trying to hook him up with the girls and, yeah. and he's like real annoyed about it. But the one thing that really caught my eye about the movie that uh, I think we haven't talked about yet is how it's shot. Like so, the film is, takes place in 1983, and it looks like it's it looks without even being too cheesy. Because I feel like some films are like we're gonna make it look like yeah. it was Real from back 80s, then, yeah. yeah, and it looks straight. But it just looks like it's like not trying too hard. It's just like a level of graininess yeah. that you would expect from an older yeah. film that just looks good. And the movie is like like you said, beautiful. Just seeing the countryside, just seeing yeah. like there there's like. <clears throat> Like there are certain scenes where, and that's almost where, um, why I wish I would have saw it in the theater because mm-hmm. there are certain times you see locations displayed on um on the screen, and you're like, mm-hmm. I want to be there. Like yeah. for example, when I was watching Last Jedi, when they were at the uh the like Jedi Mountain right, <laughs> spot. Right. Like, I was like, fuck, I want to go there. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is wild. Like, I want to be, I want my feet to be walking on yeah, those. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's like, so it's a very beautiful visual movie. The sound design mm-hmm. of the movie is really great. Like, it's like, is it like it, like the music is very beautiful. It's just like, and I feel like this is the first, like, heavily, no, I don't want to say first. I, it, I'd say this is. Actually, let me finish what I'm saying, and it makes sense. It's the first in a while that, like, a truly art house movie is being praised. Because this is a very artsy movie. Yeah. And I feel oh, like yeah. there was an era, era where, like, we were getting so many art house movies, and then it just was like, all right, chill. Yeah. And then, like, <laughs> I feel like people kind of got tired of it. But this is, like, I feel like in a long while, one of the like an art house movie getting this mainstream that mm-hmm. people are like into it. Well, it's funny that you bring up the thing about the look of the movie, because when I started watching it, the first thing I started thinking of, is this shot on 16 millimeter? What, <laughs> no, like, it's 35. Is it 35? It's 35. Cause yeah. I, that was the one that was like the most striking thing to me was this definitely authentically feels like it's shot in like 1983. And I totally forgot that it took place in 83. And I saw what army hammer was wearing when he like yeah. changes. I'm like, 
why the hell does he look so 80s? And I was like, wait a second, it takes place in 1983. Yeah. <laughs> well, what did you think of the movie, Elizabeth? Oh, no, I I loved it. I This is one of those films where it's a, just a very simple story mm-hmm. and it takes its time and it lives in the world and mm-hmm. it lives in the characters. And then it gives you like a little piece at the ending to make it bigger than that little story that you saw from one person. And that's what I feel like just really makes those things soar. Like you can have those slice of life movies that are just perfect and beautiful, but then when you have those little extra moments at the end that takes it to like a bigger level. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like the conversation with the dad and just sort of him thinking about what he talked about while looking into the fire and it speaks Mm -hmm. to something else. And this film does that. And I think that's like a real powerful thing. Um, It reminds me uh, in a very different way. It kind of had the tone of Brooklyn from two years ago, Mm -hmm. which uh, it's this slow moving film about this kind of life story and then a choice. And then then it kind of has a bigger message about kind of society and the country. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's. The th- I think what makes it work is that it really is uh, Elio's story. It, he's, yeah. not, he's nineteen, um, and I could see a lot 17. of people. 17. Oh, seventeen. Yeah. My, my it's, mistake. My it's mistake. Italy, so. Oh, fair. Um, <laughs> but I think um, he I, smokes. It's fine. I, I, I think what I, what I really loved about it was, and I could see a lot of people being turned off by this. Like I, I'm actually kind of surprised. I haven't, I haven't seen the internet as large discover the movie and go. I hated that kid because he is playing to some extent a young petulant man who gets frustrated and like throws himself on his bed and all this other stuff. And that's usually a character the internet will turn on yeah. real, real quick. quick yeah. Um, so I, and, but I loved it and I loved how like the reason I think uh, T- uh, Timothy Salome is getting all this praise is like, that's not an easy kind of character to play is petulant young man. Um, who's discovering himself, but the journey of it is great. I think army hammer is fantastic in this as well. So oh, damn. Army good. hammer great. is Army Hammer. Yeah. Oh, Army Hammer's Army Hammer. Yeah. But I feel like people like he doesn't get because he has those like classic good looks, right? And he has it, and so like Hollywood kind of kept putting him in these leading man roles of movies that should have been hits but then weren't. Yeah. It kind of felt like Hollywood. Went, we don't know what to do with him. Yeah. And I think putting him in this kind of role was perfect because he's supposed to be an object of desire. He's kind of supposed to have that classic Hollywood man look that both men and women would go whoa. whoa and yeah. so that works. But then it also this the role allowed him to show that he's great in all these other aspects as well. And he really, his character really flips in terms of vulnerability because, I mean, he's older and he's developed this kind of protective exterior and that's kind of what the kid complains about at the beginning is like I think he's a jerk and then the mom's like well maybe he's just shy (laughs) and then you get to know him after their relationship really takes off and he does a complete 180 in terms of how he plays on screen Mm -hmm. yeah in terms of how much he brings and how the warmth and just the tone of and it was just kind of amazing yeah and the young female actress I don't hear enough people talking about I thought she did great too like Elliot the the girl who's really in the Leo. Yeah. yeah, it was just, I felt like a very simple movie, and I think that's kind of why it worked as well as it did. Uh, and those are tend to be the movies that I tend to really fall in love with. I loved... Oh, and I love those two Italians who showed up for that one scene and oh, just yeah. talked over everyone. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. So good. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, uh, and it's very interesting because the director and both the, and both, uh, the leads have talked about, like, that they're already prepping for a sequel, which is fascinating. Oh, really? Because the book, yeah. where the book ends at the fire, the book has like 40 more pages where the book jumps ahead 20 years. Really? And it's about these characters now. The director said that he doesn't necessarily see himself. And actually, the author of the book was in the film. Uh, he oh, played, really? he was one of the two the two men in the uh, gay relationship. He was the shorter guy, bald, oh, is the author of the book. Oh, wow. Um, and so the director has said that because the book jumps ahead, that kind of allows them some creative freedom. He said he would like this to be his before series. Where he returns to these characters every like not ten years but five years, and it's like where are they where are they now in the late eighties? Yeah. Where are they in the nineties? I and he's, like this so much more than the before series. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love the before series, but um, uh, but he he's already said that, and he already said because the late eighties, he said that the second film will probably very much deal with AIDS and that sort oh. of thing. Um, and he's but he also said like that doesn't necessarily mean one of these two characters will get that, right? But that now in the late 80s as two men you know growing beyond a movie about uh young men discovering themselves what do you do to now they're men mm-hmm. and they've discovered themselves yeah. so it sounds like that's going to be after suspiria his next film interesting i think the thing that i really liked about the movie too was when you when those two characters finally do get together you feel so happy for them yeah even though you know that it's potentially going to come to an end like i'm 
it's like you were saying earlier. You almost expect that a movie like that, it's going to sort of hit a low point where parents find out and it's a whole freak out. And, then, you know, they, they're not sure if they're going to be allowed to be together and all these sort of things. And it doesn't do that thing. It just lets yeah. them have their time together and then they go their separate ways. And it just like very simple. Yeah, it's like very simple, but very beautifully told. I really like that movie so Man, much. It's, it's really refreshing to see really nice parents. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Like, how I often agree. do you get to see like really yeah. nice parents who are like yeah. intellectual and smart people who are also very caring? Yeah, yeah it's just like ah, oh, that's the dream. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's this great scene uh, near the very beginning, uh, but there's this great scene when Elio starts talking about the the girl that he's kind of seeing, and he goes, "Oh, we almost had sex last night." And Michael Stover goes, "Oh, why didn't you?" And she's like, oh, "I don't know." <laughs> it's just kind of this like very what probably the Republican Party fears of liberal parents is they're just yeah. like live your life. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, man, Italian parents are great. Yeah. <laughs> and then they have, is the, was it the grandma that's like always just in the kitchen, just like taking care of everybody and doing mm-hmm. laundry and cleaning and making sure everyone like has everything that they need. And I'm like, man, this like feels. Oh, and even for like the nosy grandma, she's fine. Like she like comes out and she's complaining and she's like, it's so like, Elio should do this. And then he's like, I'm 17. Why is she bossing me yeah. around? And then the mom says, Elio's fine. And she goes, okay. Yeah. And then she leaves. And that's it. That's all. That's as far as that argument went. Yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful movie. Um, and, uh, yeah. I think, again, another one is the third movie in a row. We're going to go see it. We're like yeah. Everyone go see it. Uh, let us know what you think uh, for sure in the comments below. And go to Italy. Yeah. Oh it's man. Beautiful. Never have I wanted to go. I mean, I've always wanted to travel, but never have I been like, oh, I gotta go to Italy. It's just like because I've been there, and you know, you see some of those little streets and stuff. I'm like, oh, I go back. Yeah. It looks so nice. Oh wow. man. And this movie also made me want to go to like an old dance club. Yeah. <laughs> just like right. One single night that goes. Yeah. Like this, just... <laughs> just doing it. <laughs> <laughs> just not giving a shit. Are you dancing with anybody or alone? Who cares? Just go, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah guys if you see any of the three movies we talked about today go down oh, in the comments man. and let us know what you thought of the three D- agree or disagree uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on these three films um, so next week we're going to be talking about Good Time as the required viewing and the two films I think we're going to be talking about paired together uh, is Three Billboards mm-hmm. and I think we're still trying to figure out yeah, what the tossing, next one is we keep tossing, tossing names around and we're not sure because we've paired up other movies that I think pair well together Maybe Three of Billboards just has to be that one of the nine that has to be kind of like on its own. Wait, do we have enough days for... Before the Oscars? Uh, to, to do one by itself? I think we do. Yeah, I maybe. think so. I think so. I think so. Yeah, and maybe it's worth talking about Three of Billboards on its own because, again, our, our guest Rochelle was not a fan of the film Yeah. Uh, for some of the reasons that people are talking about, that it's a, a white guilt story dealing with African-American and issues. Why don't you pair it with Get Out? You think pair it? Well, we were thinking about That's Lady Bird with thinking. Get Out. Do you think... Yeah. I feel like it's, it's get out, yeah, get out, and uh, three billboards. All right, yeah, I'm in. All right, I three saw billboards it. and get out. So go check out Get Out, which is readily available right now on Blu-ray and DVD. And three billboards <laughs> is playing at uh, pretty much everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, at this it's point. coming. It's coming to Amazon Prime. I think February 13th, which I think that's a Tuesday. I think. Yeah, I think so. So by the time we record the show next week, or no, no, we have another week, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, we'll ah. figure it out. Just go watch the movie. Yeah, if it's you, in theaters, watch yeah. it. You watch it, disagree, or agree with our take. So, good time, get out, and three billboards. Um, also, we have that it giveaway that we're doing. We do have the it giveaway. So, uh, for those of you that didn't watch last week, in the comments below, tell us uh, A, one thing you'd like to see on Cineverse since it is continuing, and uh, two, uh, if you're excited about it and what, you know, what gets you excited about it, that kind <laughs> of a thing. Uh, and next week, we're going to draw a winner and say, you have won a Blu ray of it. Um, which is another movie that we loved yeah. uh, from last year. Uh, Ippy Man, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, anything you want to plug? Anything people got to check out? Uh, yeah, you could get my album. It's on iTunes, Apple Music, uh, I just listened Spotify. to it again the other day. It's great. Uh, <laughs> the Community College Dropout, you could check it out there. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, more news to come uh, of other things. <laughs> You also follow uh, Ify on Instagram, where uh, you can often see him using the pink circle <laughs> thing in his Instagram stories oh, yeah. uh, on everything. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the best filter. <laughs> uh, Adam, what about you? Uh, you can just find me on Hyperheroes and here on Cineverse and at Adam Havoc on all the social meds. Elizabeth? Uh, just Ford Prefix Kid on social media. Uh, as for me, uh, Twitter.com slash Jurassic Alien. You'll see me plug in a lot of stuff there. 
Uh, so go over there and check that out. And y'all, we'll see you next week talking about more movies. Keep it here at Hyper RPG. Bye. Woo!